Hey guys, welcome back to the preview show. As always, I'm your host, Nico Sorrell. I'm joined today with Hunter and Trevor. How are we doing today, boys? Good. Ready? Doing good. We're for some West Coast disc golf. Yeah, it's going to be. one way, huh? West Coast yeah. um, I like I forgot it's not taboo anymore. I can like still say that. Yeah. <laughs> so this weekend we've got the OTB Open presented by MVP. Uh, once again at Swenson Park in Stockton, California. So this course typically plays with a lot of fast greens, low ceiling, uh, and then in our back nine we see a lot of uh, water carries. Uh, last year we also saw a lot of our power throwers pretty much dominate uh, this course with a lot of rollers. A uh, bunch of high, over-the-top, over-the-tree shots, and then we also saw a lot of power-driven low shots. Uh, what are some things that y'all will be looking out for this week? Yeah, I remember, um, to be honest with you, this course, I had to like go refresh myself a little bit because this event slash course in the Portland Open kind of meld together in my head. Um, I think because we, we typically, they're both on golf courses. They're similar to play them. We, we play them both in the same type of year where like wild horse sticks out because everything's kind of dead out there now we're in a time of year where like everything is green um very dumb reason for them to blend together but i think that's <laughs> literally it it's like there's two golf courses they're all green they're green um but no i think the otb open i remember um the first few years like it was on tour the first year or two like people didn't really like the roller aspect some players some fans I kind of enjoy it. I think that, you know, when, when you, you do go to golf courses, the golf course provides so many amenities and stuff that like, you just can't, we just don't quite have at disc golf courses yet that you need to find some way to make it unique. And I think that what OTB open has done is like you said, the water carries and stuff. But the big thing that everyone typically remembers about OTB open is the low ceiling shots. And I think that, yep. you know, that is a unique way to defend a course that we don't see utilized a lot. And I think it's a pretty exciting thing. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about yourself, like you put me on a course and I had to be throwing more than one or two rollers around, I'm not super comfortable with that. Yeah. The pros are going to be more comfortable, but it's still not a shot they're asked to throw a lot. And I like courses that ask pros to throw shots they're not used to throwing. It's an interesting setup. I actually, I think it looks like a really fun course to play. Um, personally, the low ceiling is very interesting because you might think, oh, well, it's limiting distance, but actually it, it gives the power players an advantage because to get distance the power players can just throw hyzer flips to flat and just push whereas lower arm speed players have to get more of a flex out of their disc or more height that's harder to do with low ceiling so it really gives them an advantage um you're also with because of the low ceiling you're forced to throw shots that are going to skip more so players are going to have to deal with that and really focus on their disc angle um i think it's also interesting you know a lot of the holes you'll notice they aren't necessarily low ceiling the whole way but they do what they do at portland a lot which is put the tee box like there's an immediate like pair of trees yeah. to where the ceiling is low straight off the tee box but then it kind of goes to the open and then you see it kind of finish back under they a lot of the greens are you know around trees uh so you will see a lot of different golf you're going to see a lot of like cut like low cut rollers um you will see some air shots people trying to beat trees go around them but a lot of times you're forced to throw straight under them and it, it is kind of fascinating but yeah look for the guys who can generate a lot of speed on low lines are going to have an advantage because we're getting further up fairways a lot of these par fours you know there are some par fours that are shorter distances than we're used to i think because of those low ceilings because they know guys can't attack but you will see i mean the likes of you know anthony barella and and such being able to get way further down the fairway to the as long as he doesn't roll his ankle this year yes also true oh, where he rolled his ankle yes can't be doing that but I, it looks like a really fun setup and then with the water in play as well like it's it's it looks really good so i'm i'm excited to watch it yeah and the weather for this weekend is actually going to be pretty sunny pretty standard uh about 10 miles per hour for the wind so not a whole lot of wind but still some wind to consider when throwing these rollers uh so we're going to go straight into our storyline segment in our MPO, we don't have a Paul, we don't have Ricky, and to be honest, I don't think anyone really cares. Uh, Dang, our, that's an intense one. Look, all I'm saying is we have a young generation of disc golfers that are coming up, and they're doing phenomenal. Uh, we're seeing Isaac Robinson, Silas Schultz, Gannon, we haven't seen like a huge splash from this year. Same thing with Anthony Barella, but Anthony actually did very well at this event last year, so I expect to see something out of him. Um, who are y'all looking out for in the MPO? Well, first off, if Paul and Rick were on a feature card this weekend, 
the views would probably be like a solid 50, 60,000 more on Jomez. Uh, that's just a fact. You, right. That's just I'll, a I'll matter of that. fact. Yep. Um, but you know, so yeah, I think the field misses them, but you are right. This is a lot different. If this had happened game. five years ago. It would have been really bad. That's about, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's a lot different ball game than even 2018. Like even yeah. just that is five years ago. Holy crap. We're old. Yes. I was thinking 2015 was five years ago. These last three years have flown. Anywho, um, <laughs> if we're, lo- if we're looking back in that 2015, 2018, 19 range and you miss Paul and Rick at an event, it's like, why are we even watching? Right. right. That's not the case anymore because realistically, Without Paul and Rick, the best players in the world are still there. Mm. Yes. And that's not something that's been true about this sport for a very long time. Yeah. But like you're looking at this list and you, you put some down here, like Isaac Robinson, I think is going to struggle out here. Si- Silas Isaacson's on the list. That's funny. Silas Schultz, um, <laughs> Gannon Burr, uh, Gannon Burr, Anthony Barella, they're, they're Eagle McMahon, Calvin Heimberg. There's so many players that I would have probably picked over Paul and Ricky anyways, right? That realistically, the only time we're, we're going to be missing them, it feels is during this first round, like this feature card, they would have been on it. Right. Um, it's tough to know, like Ricky, I think we still is a big question mark around him. Paul at this point, he's headed to Europe. We know that he's had, he's having a slow season. Um, it'll be interesting to see what Europe does to his momentum. Yeah. Cause I do think he's a, he is a momentum player. I think if he gets a, a full head of steam ahead of him in Europe, then he might just be able to tear up Europe when the rest of the pros join him over there and then come back to the States with like a full head of steam. But flip side of that coin, slow start. The European competition is worse, but it's still not bad. Yeah. There's, they, still, there's if, guys out there. If Paul, the interesting shoe Paul's in now is going into the season and I was definitely guilty of this. I think a lot of people were, I basically chalked up the entire European swing as win, 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 or at four. least like, at least like four out of five. Think, before yeah. we get to right. the actual full pro tour in European open, I'm like, well, Paul's going to lock up a bunch of wins. I'm not in that same headspace anymore. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think Paul now has an interesting amount of pressure on him because like if he, if he's in the States and he loses to Calvin Gannon, so it is what it is. We know those guys are legit. If he loses to people that we don't know the name of, it's now an interesting question of like, well, Paul's struggling this year. Is that guy legit? Or did Paul just have another bad weekend? Um, it's an interesting question that I'm not, I don't know. I, I, I think that this Europe trip, obviously it's a lot more about growing the sport, a lot more about brand building, um, growing disc craft over. There's a lot of other things other than the play but we're here to talk about the play. And I think play wise, this isn't going to be as good of a trip as it could have been for Paul's brand. Yeah, no, I agree. I I would, it's going to be very interesting to watch. I almost be bummed out a little bit if I were the players over there getting ready. Cause like, you don't want to be invalidated if you beat Paul, but there will be questions of like, well, he's not really been himself this year, yeah. but I, I think it'll still be pretty significant. I'm, I'm very interested to see what those leaderboards look like. It's going to be fascinating. Yeah. So what do you think, where on the leaderboard do you think he'll have to place to build momentum to come back to first, America? First, Dominate. first. That's it. First. In every tournament? I'll give him one, but that one, he better be like in second. Yeah. I, you, you you can't walk into a field sheesh. of two, the main field, nobodies, right? Where a lot of the players he's playing, we don't know over there, right? They're not tour proven players. You can't walk into that field and not win. It's the same thing if... And I know it's a different scale, but it's a similar thing. If Paul plays an A tier here, that's fine. Play the A tier, have fun. You better win. Like you got it. If you're playing against players that aren't, you know, regularly on tour, if it'd be a different story, if we had like Calvin's having the year he's having, and he went over there and he lost now, like Trevor said, the perception of that player is he just beat the best player in the world when the best player in the world is hot. Yeah. That is now the storyline. Isn't wow. Calvin lost. It's wow. This guy won. The story right now, if Paul goes over to Europe and loses two, three, four times, and especially if he like finishes in like eighth or something wild, and the storyline isn't look at these seven players that just beat Paul. It's wow, Paul's struggles are continuing. Right. Um, and so I, I, I don't know. In my opinion, going to Europe again, it's about so much more than the play for the sport. But we're here to talk about the play. He better win. That that's the standard I have. I agree. Okay. I agree. 
Okay. So obviously I did mean Silas Schultz and not Silas Isaacson, even though he would tear up this weekend. <laughs> yeah. um, Silas I Schultz. Oh man, Silas, Silas needs an overhand. It doesn't sound like they're ceiling for that. <laughs> so he might struggle up. there. So um, we've seen Silas Schultz has plenty of power. How do you expect him to perform this weekend? Do you think he'll be able to compete with Simon or Drew? He's Who's not going to be there. No, thank God. He's, he's registered, but he's not going. He's not going. Yeah. Okay. When I asked him about it. Because I was about to be like, that's a very tough question. And I'm glad I don't have to answer it. It's kind of, I, I'm starting to realize it, it's almost like, unless I had, uh, like, unless I literally had asked him, like, I would have thought he was going to, but like, it, we need like some kind of like better live registration. Well, situation. the problem I think with the current registration format is it, it auto registers. It people. auto registers. Yeah. You sign up for the tour pass or whatever, yeah. and it auto puts you in and you have to withdraw. Yeah. Cause he told me he was like, God. he was thinking about going out to like, uh, to hang out with somebody, but he was like, yeah, I'm not going. Well, the, um, we just went to a PGA tour event and leading up to it, basically the field was empty. Yeah. It just had, but players were, it seemed like, the players who were in Silas Schultz's shoes where you were qualified, you could register. Yeah. What they called it instead of registered players was confirmed players. I think is basically what it was. So like on the like player list on the website two months ago, there's just like two players and like we, and one of them was Rory. So we were like, well, that's sick at least. But then as it got closer, more and more players started to confirm. Mm -hmm. So then eventually you had the full field. Uh, yeah, I kind of like that. That would make sense. Um, where like these tour pass players, you have a spot, but you have to confirm your spot. Yeah. So it's like, it's not yeah. yours, but you just have to confirm yes or no. And then like, if you, and you have a deadline to confirm, right. And it, it could be as simple as like the pro tour sends out an automated email and it's like, confirm your spot. And if you don't confirm it, then okay, now we can open it up to X, Y, Z. Somebody people. even, uh, whenever Paul, I, he's not on the registration list now, but I think he must have been at some point um, for OTB because, like, he posted, you know, whenever uh, the last event was, he posted, like, this is my last event in the US for a while. And people were commenting, like, oh, I sure hope you're not missing OTB. Like, I already bought tickets. So it was like that situation is kind of dangerous, but I, yeah, cause like I, I, I kind of forgot that about Sal Schultz this morning and I was like, oh man, he could have a really good event out here. And then I was like, oh yeah, he's not going to, he's not going unless like he made some last minute change of mind. See, like I could be wrong right now, but like the last I heard he's not going, which was last week. So yeah, that different talking point, but you know, and I, well, to, I'm glad he's not going because that question would put me in a. I would have a very hard time answering. I don't know how he would perform out there. <laughs> there. I think that he has a game to play very well at a course like this, but it's also, I don't know. It's also a somewhat unique course that I don't think fully suits his game. So I don't know if, if he does show up, it'll be very interesting to watch where he finishes. Yeah. I wish the information uh, for them showing up to these events would be out there a little bit more accurately so that the people writing these questions <laughs> wouldn't have to worry about it. I mean, yeah. It's impossible. Okay. Yeah. It's impossible. <laughs> um, so looking back on last year, the lead card for the final round was Anthony Barella, Drew Gibson. It was Simon Lazat and it was no. Calvin. Calvin was the only one who was throwing pretty much flex, low flex shots. I didn't see a ton of rollers on that last round. Mm -hmm. um, do you think throwing the air shot is, is what is limiting him from taking a first place? Or do you think that the other players just need to like choke out there. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, his round the last year, Simon was just really hot. He was just tough to beat. That uh, was what it really came down to. Um, now I will say Calvin, Calvin is somebody that can win at a power throwers course, but he's not usually first on my list to win in the power throwers course. Like, I think there are other players who definitely like gain strokes, on Calvin at the, at the sub of course, not because he lacks in power, but like there is just a, there is a different level to the power game. And I wouldn't put him at that upper echelon of guys like Eagle and AB and, and Simon and guys who can really, really rip. Um, so I think it's like probably a type of event where you will more likely see him like getting the lead card or finishing top five, but maybe not having quite enough to win. Uh, but you know, he is still very consistent. So like, yeah, the power throwers can get themselves in trouble and then, you know, he can be right there on the doorstep. But yeah, I think there is a little bit for him to overcome. I'm not sure. It's weird. Like 
you almost have to be reminded each year, like who are the good roller players on tour because like you don't see it a ton. We know that Drew Gibson's a pretty good roller player. Eagle McMahon's probably the best in the world at rollers. He's or he's definitely up there. Um, so like you will see some of those guys probably take advantage, but it also depends on just the wind um, as well. Yeah, I don't think that the the roller is a big factor, but I don't think it's the determining factor. Okay. Um, and a player like Calvin, he's so good at those low flex lines. I think that the players who can excel well um, without the roller is a player like Calvin's play style where you can throw that really tight, low ante and have it flex because that gives the disc so much more air and players that can do the opposite but accomplish the same thing which is the hyzer flip which also gives the disc so much more air Mm -hmm. um and so i think that calvin i don't think he he could throw rollers um very easily he has a very complete game but obviously last year he was electing to shy away from it in a lot of places and i think that it's a uh lean towards his consistency where he's kind of betting like the roller, no matter how good you are at rollers, they are unpredictable. Like I feel like final round two that you're, you're less likely to see him as often because it's just like, you don't want that to be the way you lose is throwing a roller. (laughs) It's like, let's say a pine cone fell. Right. And like you hit the pine cone, stupid pine cones or a stick that wasn't that you like are a little off path and there's a big stick. Like there's so many things with the roller that it brings into play that like, I think Calvin's mind is more like, yeah, I could gain 75 feet of distance throwing the roller over my flex air shot, but my flex air shot, I'm in full control of that thing. Like if I hit my line and it flexes down this gap, I can see everything that I need to miss on a roller. You can't see everything you need to miss. Um, and also like it could hit and get a weird skip rollers. Just there's a lot more unpredictability and Calvin doesn't seem to be that guy that like plays that, that risk reward game at that level. He likes to be in control of everything as much as possible. That's why we see him playing aggressive down the stretch. Cause he takes things into his control. He's slowly becoming my favorite player. Um, but I think that this is another, you know, testament to his mental game and how he views the game is he likes being in control. I think that's why he likes the air shot over the roller. When a lot of players would disagree on this course. Okay. Yeah. So this year we see Calvin is obviously dominating, uh, um, the entire field. Um, let's just be honest. But what do you think has changed from last year to this year that has allowed him to dominate and so consistently at the top, like in the top five? I think it's just consistency, to be honest with you. I mean, if you look at last year, like when when he was at his best, um, no one could beat him. Realistically, he was he's one of those players. Like before the back in the day, there was two players that that was true of. As times progress, you know the list is built to four or five guys. Where if they're at their best, but there's only one that's truly if they're at their best, no one can beat them. And Calvin this year, that's him. Um, I think it's some of it is like if you look at his game. He hasn't changed anything drastically. He's always been a good putter. He's always playing the same style. He's always somehow not rolling his ankle in those running shoes that he wears while he plays. His game stays the same. But what is happening this year is I think he's getting a lot of momentum from seeing that his play style pay off, seeing time and time again. I think it's boosting his confidence. I think his confidence, like, and you see this in a lot of sports, when guys get into this rhythm where they start to feel untouchable, they are untouchable. And the only key shift, especially in a golf is between your ears. Um, and I think that his mental space right now is just in a lot better space than other people where the field's a lot more scared of Calvin than Calvin is of the field with a few exceptions, mainly in my opinion, being Gannon Burr and Eagle McMahon come into this event. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I think, um, confidence is probably a big part of it you know as he gains momentum it's kind of like a snowball going downhill at this point uh, i think his circle two putting has been pretty good this year i think that's like when his circle two putting is on uh he becomes even more dangerous because you know throwing wise he's just so consistent and i think it's just really paying off I, I, it'll be interesting to see you know i don't think every course necessarily fits his place i mean they all fit it to some extent i don't think that every course he'll dominate with his play style but he'll always give himself a chance to win and when you're already building so much momentum and you have a chance to win on the final day you feel a lot less pressure than maybe the guys trying to get their first one of the season and so like the more you continue that that downhill momentum you become very hard to stop on the final day and he gets himself in contention on the final day almost every single week yeah absolutely so i'm gonna give you all simon to repeat another victory or calvin is going to take this event back under his belt he's going to do it this year yeah which one of y'all take it 
I'm leaning more towards Calvin for sure. For what reason? Yeah, I mean, he's beating Just Simon. Betting Simon's beating him right now. Yeah. But Simon, Simon has a new bag this year. You got to think of that. But he is, he, he's proven he can win sure. with it already. And we saw yeah. last year that he was throwing rollers and skip low skip shots well, and, very, and everything. Every week, and it was like, we go into, there's another question about Simon's bag, right? How often when you're doing first some. work and learning your bag, do you throw rollers out there? Like it's Simon. Si- it's Simon. It's Simon. That's I mean, that's can, something that he can does. Only answer so many questions with it, Simon. I mean, sure, Simon could easily walk away with this win, like no doubt. Calvin's more likely to walk away with this win. I'll explain it in my predictions. I don't think either of them are going to, but I think that they those two are definitely two of the favorites coming in. Yeah, I um, I Simon is kind of a wild card here. He's won already this season. He won last year. I like him a lot at this event. I'm not sure how I feel about Calvin. Honestly, if I had to bet on either one to win, I, I would. It, it's, I'm pretty torn. I'm pretty fifty fifty on it, just because like you got to under like it's really hard to get easy it wrapped up in the calvin momentum but you got to remember this is golf so like yeah. it, it, you know it doesn't matter if he won last week or the five weeks before right. uh, you know it, there is that element of like sometimes sometimes there is just going to be a breaking point with the streak like that mm-hmm. um and i yeah i don't know i don't i don't think calvin's game purpose uh, perfectly matches his course. Like I love him for top five. I don't necessarily love him to be winning. He lost by two last year. Yeah, I know. I, I know he was in it. I'm just saying. Like I, I just. I mean, we're, we're talking a lot about Simon this, Simon that, and the Calvin lost by two last year. He lost yeah. by two. He lost. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. Two strokes. Like I, I'm saying. Like I don't necessarily really different season this year going into it. Though. I'm just saying if a power thrower gets hot i don't like calvin to be able to overpower that necessarily so that's why i i i'm pretty 50 50 split on that okay yeah i don't know if i could side either way okay. Okay. if i had to bet if you said a hundred dollars i would probably put it on calvin though okay if it were really up to that i take that bet i like that all right so we're gonna move on to our fpo uh paige pierce originally i think we were talking that she wasn't gonna play because she was injured but then she actually is gonna play and she's supposed to be taking it easy do y'all think she should actually be taking time off and actually recover? Or it actually, you know what? I just had an interesting thought. What if, what if she has like a Simon injury situation where she has to take it easy? It changes her game plan. She doesn't do anything over aggressive, and she like dominates. It could happen I, for sure. I, I kind of it kind of like makes sense to my brain a little bit. Here's what I'm gonna say: is I think I think Paige Holt is coming back too early personally um okay. we see this a lot with disc golfers um but page is in the shoes that i feel like we wouldn't see it like because you have i feel like you just see i feel like you see that a lot in athletes just in general like people just wanted to get it, back out it there. all depends on people always want to get back out there yeah but you got to make the smartest choice for your future right? right and in disc golf i fully understand if i've got like a nagging ankle injury we'll say but my life greatly depends on me cashing at events like how i make my money the majority i understand coming back a little too early and not letting it fully rest because if i take two more events off like that could greatly change whether i can survive on the road or not Paige pierce isn't in those shoes Paige pierce is getting her paycheck from a lot of different ways and her cashing on the course is just a little like cherry on top so in my opinion don't come back till you're fully a hundred percent. If you need to take it easy at an event because you're not ready to play yet, you're not ready to play yet. And so I don't, cause like what could happen and I don't know the full scope of her injury, but with injuries in general, most of them, what could happen is recovery is going good. You're healing up. You're almost back. You go play, re hurt it. Now it's worse. And what right. should have been healed in like next week, she should be back at a hundred percent might knock her out for now three more events. Um, obviously what also could happen is she could be come back, play this event, nothing go wrong. She plays great. She wins, walks away. Everything's fine. But I think the key, I just don't think I don't like risking. The key thing to remember people. though, is she is being advised by a medical professional. Like it's not like she just making her own decision. So I, 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 I do not think that she would be out there. If Seth Muncie said you could re injure this and it could be really bad. If you go out there, I don't think she'd be, but on her Instagram, she also said that she was out there playing the course, but she was also throwing new shots. 
And like, if you're trying to protect your injury, I don't think you do I, that by trying. I, I honestly, I things. like, I like seeing a bit of competitiveness from Paige these days. I like seeing the fact that she is wanting to push herself to go play and be competitive. Um, I have a weird feeling about the whole like taking it easy and throwing less like more conservative shots maybe like that that gives I'm getting weird vibes from that like that could be interesting to watch but yeah I mean Hunter I mean you're right like you obviously don't I don't think any player should risk it but I think that's it comes down to you know she is being advised if it were her own decision then you'd be like hmm I don't know but if the medical professional is telling her that she can play then I don't think it's like anything we should be well, from what it sounded like on her Instagram, the medical professional is telling her like, "Hey, pull back the reins, take it easy." It's but he didn't say opinion, don't play. In my opinion, it sounds very much like if if the medical professional, which is Seth Muncy's one of them, there's also a physical therapist she was going to, but I would bet that if they were like, "What's the smartest, a hundred percent your decision? Like this is your kid decision." If you're telling a player take off the reins, pull it back, take it easy. Why play? Well, I mean, that's a huge assumption you just made. That is a huge assumption. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I, was, I was assuming. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't. I think if I'm just reading I, between the lines on how she's talking, and she's saying like after her round, there's some inflammation, but it's so much better than it used to be. There's some inflammation, is what she just said. So after the round, she's still hurt. I don't know. Tiger won. Tiger Woods won the U.S. <laughs> Open on a broken leg, and it was heroic. So what's he doing right now? He had an awesome career. I mean, you said it yourself. Paige makes her money elsewhere. So if she goes out, wins, and then she's hurt for two months, who cares? She got a win, and, and you know, she'll be back. If she goes out and wins. That's but she could also go out, play two rounds, hurt it worse, DNF. I, did, not I think if the, risk was that, if the risk was that high, I really don't believe she'd be playing. I don't I, I, my, it, I'm not a I think that's debatable. by any means. But what she's talking about, from how she is wording things, I don't think she should be playing this weekend, personally. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, can we, PhD. if she ends, I said I wasn't a medical professional. I started that sentence with, that. if she ends up winning, do we downplay it? Because Kristen is not there. Uh, do, I, do, do, you, do, do you downplay? Uh, but yeah, when, when, yeah, you got to beat the field in front of you, but and we got Kristen's a, definitely Kristen just beat. lost last week too. So it's like, I, I don't think, I think because but it's of, also Kristen, right. But I think because of pages season so far, I mean, with FPO, a lot of times you can just kind of pass the eye test of like, did everybody in front of Paige just fall over and like just let her walk through? Or like there are there are times where FPO feels like, and this is MPO too sometimes, where it feels like, wow, that player really went out and earned it and battled. And in times where it's like, well, everybody in front of them just kind of coughed it up. Um, so, you know, we'll be able to kind of have that eye test. But also, um, I, I think because of the season Paige has had, and the injury situation, if she wins, those storylines will very much outweigh like, oh, but Kristen wasn't there. You know, like, yeah, she was she wouldn't have been there, but there's still good players in that field. I mean, we like I said, we just saw Kristen lose last week. So that's pretty fresh in everybody's mind. Had Kristen won last week too, and that we're still on that kind of like that streak we've hadn't been having where it's like, oh, Kristen just is the FPO field, then we might think about it more. But it's like it's very fresh in everybody's minds that you know, Kristen just lost. So like, yeah, I think it'd be, it'd be a very significant win for Paige. It would be huge. It would yep. be huge. Yeah. No comment. I mean, I, I mean, I think it would be slightly tainted by Kristen not being there, but it depends. It all depends on how she did it because like, yeah, right. sure. Cause I if she wins by 10, it's like, Kristen's, well, Kristen's silver series win, right at the blue Ridge championship. Yeah. It was obvious. It didn't matter who was in that field. Kristen was going to win. Right. Because yeah. you can look at the, the performance of her and like, certain players when they're dominant Katrina Allen, Paige Pierce, Kristen Tatar, when they're at their best and you watch them play, you can tell no one was beating them that weekend. If that's what we see out of Paige, first off, my jaw will be on the floor. Secondly, then yeah, we'd be, it's pretty easy to say Kristen wouldn't have mattered if she was there, but it all depends. Like if she squeaks by and wins by one and it's like one of those like back and forth towards the end scrappy, then yeah, it might be something like, well, well but Kristen wasn't there. But I, yeah. I don't expect Paige Pierce in the top eight, personally this weekend. I don't, I don't think she's going to be on leader chase car. Okay. I, I don't think. I think she's going to be out there, and I, again, I just don't see her being a factor in this weekend's tournament. I could be very wrong. I just don't see it. I mean, it's not too. It's it's gotten very easy to say that at least at this point. Like yeah. I feel it still feels like weird when you ever you say like, oh, like Paige probably won't even be top ten, but like it's started to become common at this point. It's crazy. Yeah, it used to be insane to say something like that yeah heinous uh so earlier in the season i was a big advocate for ella hansen and she started off doing well and then she kind of fell off last year at this event she placed in the top five 
expectation for her going into this weekend. I think this course suits her well, um, but she has not had the season you would expect even at courses that suit her well. Yeah. I think Holland Hanley's the new Ella Hansen. Um, like last year, it seemed like we go to a that was fast. Yeah. I, well, last year, it, it it's kind of like, true though. It seems like we went to a big co- a thrower's course, you know, a uh, lot of distance required. And you're like, th- could this be Ella Hansen's weekend this year? I'm asking myself those questions about Holland Hanley. I'm not really thinking too much about Ella Hansen, but she does still throw very far. This is still a thrower's course. This the stars could align where this could be her weekend. Um, but I mean, to be honest with you, I'm not expecting a ton just because I think that there's been other opportunities this year at different courses that she's underperformed. And so if history continues to repeat itself, I think that she would underperform what you would kind of expect from Ella Hansen. But it's it's golf, so anything can happen. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I'm in the same boat. I, it is funny that like when I look down the leaderboard, Holland Hanley is the person I like put where Ella Hansen was at the beginning of the season, where it's like okay, thrower's course, much higher chance of being up there. Ella Hansen just needs to bounce back. She needs to bounce back mm-hmm. event before I can like really start thinking about. But her I think what, three. what broke her momentum a lot was Waco. Oh sure, oh, it it destroyed her I mean, game. Yeah, I would have destroyed it. Yeah, I'd tell to come back from. We always said it right after. We're like, we'll see how this works out. Yeah, golf is such a mental game, and like. If she hasn't really recovered from that play wise. It doesn't seem, I, I, I don't think that it's still, she wakes up every morning and she's just like, man, I can have that wake up. <laughs> but I'm sure like when you're on the course and you're playing, like there might still be some timidness left over, or there might be some, maybe she's playing overly aggressive because she's trying to make sure she, who knows, but yeah. it hasn't really been the same since Waco. Right. Do you, <laughs> should we make merch? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, dang. So Holland Hanley top 10 easy bet. Is that an easy bet? I, yeah. I, I don't. I wouldn't say easy bet because it's again, never easy. It's golf, but one of the easiest ones in the field. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd like Han Hanley top ten for sure. Gotcha. Well, we also see that Haley King and Cat Merch are have been pretty dominant the last couple weeks. They tied for third at Champions Cup, and then recently Cat Merch beat Haley King at Jonesboro in a playoff. Is, I know Haley King, I expect her to do perfectly fine. She throws plenty far in her putting stroke. As long as it's consistent, she'll be in the top three in my eyes. But Cap Merch, is her luck about to run out at this course? I, I think so. Um, I don't. Cap Merch has a solid game. I'm not overly impressed with her game. I think she may. We're going we to have a little bit of shakeup this week because I think the last two events, you could argue the scoring separation wasn't really there. Um, and I think that there's going to be a lot more of this course, way, way more, uh, with OB being much more back uh, and it being a thrower's course. So I, I think that I'm not expecting anything. I would be very impressed if Cat Merch can rattle off another top five this week. Uh, Haley King, yeah, I have pretty good expectations. I think her game is rounding out, and her game is very complete when it is um, rounded out. So, yeah, I, I'm really not sure on Cat Merch. I wouldn't bet too high on her, but, but Haley King, I like at this event. I would agree. Um, I think... I think the key difference is Haley King's distance that she needs seems a little more effortless. Yeah, she, um, that was low yeah. ceiling. She wanted an issue with. And Cat Merch, I think, I think she has really solid distance for the field, but I don't think she has that elite distance. Whereas Haley King, I think is, I think Haley King is kind of in like a. Uh, Paul Macbeth shoes when it comes to distance where people don't realize how far they throw. Yeah. Like people discredit Paul's distance all the time. And it's like, well, no, when, if the dude just doesn't open up and let loose, right. Like you see double G and other players do, but the guy can throw 600. It's not their, it's not their game to throw it as hard. They're playing, trying to play smarter. He's playing golf where he's playing 80% where you have other players that are throwing 90% on shots. I think Haley King falls in that similar boat where Mm -hmm. I think Haley King has, especially her forehand distance, elite level distance in the FPO field. But I think that she's just not one of those players that digs deep into that a lot because that's just not her game. But when you come to a course like this, she still has that in reserves. So I think this is a course that would play well for Haley King. I don't see it playing super well for Kat Mersh. Um, I think that a lot of it, she's going to have to be pushing her distance. And when you push your distance, you bring in like a little bit more spraying. And when you bring in spraying, you bring in the OB. Um, so I think that I would, I would definitely lean a little more towards Haley King, but it's a similar with MPO. Like Isaac Robinson, data wise shouldn't do good this weekend. That doesn't mean Isaac Robinson's not a, a fan 
a phenomenal player. Right. Similar thing with Cat Merch. Some some courses just don't suit players' games, and like this is this opportunity where Isaac and Cat Merch could surprise us. But more than likely, they'll struggle a little bit out here, and then they'll just bounce back at a different course that suits their game a little better. Right. Gotcha. All right. You good? Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks. Uh, that's going to wrap up our storyline segment. Uh, we're going to go into our bold predictions presented by Third Wave Coffee. Hunter, can you tell us about Third Wave? Yeah, so Third Wave Coffee is actually my brother's coffee shop. I've been stoked to work with them all season long. And I want to go ahead and thank each and every one of you that has supported them, picked up some bags of coffee, especially the Bogey Bros blend. Um, that support means the world, both to us and to my brother. So shout out to all of you. Um, but if you're wondering, if it's your first time listening or something, you're wondering, what the heck is Third Wave? coffee third wave coffee is a local roaster and coffee shop to us um that is committed to ethical and sustainable sourcing for all of their coffee and have 20 single origin coffees from all over the world in stock right now plus new this year is the bogey bros blend that was taste tested and approved by myself trevor and connor and is perfect for all of you looking to dip your toes into the specialty coffee scene whether you're a specialty coffee drinker or you're like i didn't know specialty coffee was a thing until hunter just said it pick up the bogey bros blend and you probably all will enjoy it um and for those of you who are listening right now Third Wave's offering a 20% off discount code with code DISCOFF. One word, DISCOFF, gets you 20% off your order. So head over to third-wave.coffee and pick up some coffee today. And again, thank you to all of you who have already done so. Good stuff. So what's your bold prediction for this weekend? Uh, You know, let's let Trevor go first. Okay. I've got two bold predictions. Number one bold prediction is I think the scoring separation out here is going to be a shock wave. And I think that both the leaders of MPO and FPO going into the final round will not win the tournament. My number two bold prediction is the more exciting one, I think, is after the ridicule, the famous ridicule of the MVP Open trophy last year, or the OTB Open, I should say, presented by MVP, uh, which was a disc, if you weren't paying attention. I think we are going to see the best disc golf trophy that we've ever seen. That, that is that is a bold prediction. Hopefully I think it's a, if it's a trophy, it doesn't have chains on it. I, and That's I, all I'm going to say. Would, obviously, like, we've had, like, electric guitars and stuff like that, but I think this one we see, like, a more of a typical like classic looking trophy but i think it's going to be the most impressive one we've ever seen because i think i don't think they're going to take that i if they double down and do another uh, if, disc i think i think i'm flipping that. i think my bold prediction is they double down and give another if they disc. double down and give them another disc i think <laughs> i don't know i might do something crazy i think i'm gonna go with my bold prediction i'm gonna steal it down. i think my bold prediction is they double down and do another disc because got everyone talking last year gosh you know, yeah it, and not in a good way yeah, right it did good press <laughs> i guess gosh i would be i did I, was, I ratioed the pro tour on twitter because they tweeted like about that disc and i was like the only way there i don't remember how i worded it but i basically was like the only way that a trophy disc makes it onto that property better be if that disc is in Simon's bag. That would be the only way that a trophy disc is on that property it would be funny like honestly what i think they they should do is do like a a trophy that is just like a gold or silver, like really fancy looking disc, like almost like the Wimbledon tennis trophy where it's, and that's not technically a disc. I think it's more like a plate, but like, that would be a fun. What if it was just like dyed gold? They dyed gold. Dyed gold. No, the disc was just dyed. Oh, gold. oh, well, that'd be good too. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> that'd be crap. You know, I'm okay with like a, like give Simon the dyed disc and present him with a trophy to like, you know, stay don't there. hand him that dyed disc. Off of <laughs> like I'm fine with players taking that oh, home. Gosh, but like, like geez, that, thanks. that was. I mean, it was just that laughable. can't be the trophy. Yeah, it was. It was so laughable. Like, like just have a trophy that like you put the player's name on every year. Oh, you know, gosh, just don't don't and like if you want to send them home with a disc that's dyed that says like in, you know OTB Open first play, fine. But yeah. don't make that don't a trophy. Sent that you know? to him. Yeah, like that. Oh my. Was that your original bold prediction, Hunter? I didn't have one written down, ma'am. Okay. I couldn't think of one. Hunter's not very bold these good, days. Good stuff. I couldn't think of one. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, what do you got for your top three for MPO? I couldn't think of top three for MPO. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> my top three for MPO. I've changed my top three for both like four times during this show. Oh, no, I locked in. <laughs> nice. I locked in. <laughs> I just keep crossing. The, I do that now. I don't know why. I locked in early. Um, I Get think revelation. first off, I think Calvin Heimberg in third. I think you got to have him in the top three. So Calvin Heimberg third. I think Gannon Burr also this course could play well. We're gonna have a big switch up this week. So I'm gonna put him in second, mainly because like I think either of them could come top three, and I want to have him. But the player I'm pretty confident is gonna win this weekend is Eagle McMahon. Pretty, I'm very because mm-hmm. this course mm-hmm. doesn't really require many bomber forehand shots. Yep. 
does require some bomber rollers and bomber backhands. And Eagle McMahon is still 100% capable of both of those shots. He has been on a sneaky season. He's yeah. been in a lot of second place finishes where it doesn't look like he's playing good and right. he ends up in second. I think he puts it all together this weekend. And heck, I'm willing to say, I think Eagle McMahon wins by four plus strokes. Well, that's bold. Mm. That's very bold. Uh, I also have Eagle winning. I think that 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 it makes sense for this to be where he gets his season rolling. No pun intended. Um, I I went. I really doubled and tripled down on the power throwers. Um, I've got Simon in second. Okay. And I've got A B in third. Ooh. I think I okay. think that obviously excluding Calvin from the top three is really hard. But I don't think it's smart. I don't think okay. he. I don't think he wins. So I be, I'm basically forfeiting one point. Uh, well, not necessarily. I. I if you get in the right spot, I guess it's three, but I, I don't know. I just, I have a better feeling about like one of the three guys I pick. Like sometimes you just have to like think who could really win this thing. And I think the three guys that I picked could like legitimately win. And I don't think Calvin could is going to win this event. So like, I don't know. It was tough. It was very tough. And then not having Gannon, I don't know. I've been riding with Gannon like this whole season and I don't know more times than not. I feel like he's let me down. You know, that's so. you're holding him back now that you're off his back. Probably. It, I mean, it, it, probably Gannon and Calvin or will probably go off, but I don't know. I like the power throwers of this course. You know, I like Simon AB. I, I AB is a risky pick. I don't think he's that risky. You know, he finished, he was the top, I think he was fourth last year. Um, music city was the last thrower's course we played and he did really well there. Like at, he's proven that at thrower's courses, he is formidable. Um, now, but he does also that, switched his, does bag. that mean he also switched his bag? Yeah. But you know, does that mean that he's going to, I don't really believe in the bag switch mumbo jumbo. Very I only, these, uh, only, person guys I believe it in, only person I believe it in is Simon. Cause it's MVP. I have the freak that stuff even roll. I, um, I think that, you know, a B there's a very high chance that he comes out round one and two incredibly hot. And then, yeah, he might lose down the stretch, but I think he could hang on to third. That's kind of why I have him there. Okay. All right, cool. And FPO Trevor, we'll start with you. FPO is tough. I made a last second change because I caught on to that epiphany that I had. I'm going to take Paige Pierce to win it. Oh, heck yeah. I, I think that job, Hunter. I think so. I think you just handed me points. <laughs> I might have, I might have, but you, like you have to, Hey, I've got a little bit of lead in this. I've been playing it safe most of the year. I, I want to make some interesting plays because you know, Paige Pierce is not predictable as much as we want her to be. She's not predictable. And I have a weird feeling that if she's focused a little more on her arm injury and less on what she's doing out there, it might actually benefit her. It worked for Simon Lazat, And I see some very interesting parallels in this situation hmm. and it just wouldn't shock me. And she knows she's a defending champion. Kristen's not there that that already raises her odds of a top three. Um, I don't know, but the DNF could happen after round one. So that's scary. <laughs> uh, I've got Haley King in second. I like her a lot at this course. And then I'm going to go ahead with a safe pick and pick own in third. The distance is a little concerning, but you know, she's, she's always around. Yeah. She got second at champions cup, like, and she won this past weekend at whatever DGA was putting on. So, I mean, she's always around. She's there. She's, always she's around. there. I'm going with, um, I just went all throwers for FPO top three. So I got Haley King in third place. Um, Katrina Allen in second. <laughs> and I think Holland Hanley takes it down. Oh, no, no. no. I like it Holland Hanley taking it down. She, 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 just, she just can't putt. That's, well, I, I want to pick Holland Hanley every week. The Paige week. Pierce theory is a very solid theory, but I don't think this course is a course that Paige can play conservative and win. I think that Paige is going to want to be throwing aggressive lines. I feel like she's going to feel like a racehorse being held back. And if she gets a contention, I think she's going to try to let loose. Maybe game over. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. It's a risky one, but I mean, taking Holland to win her first ever is also, I mean, so I feel a little more confident knowing that both of our first place picks are like a little out there. Yeah. I like, I like Holland winning. Okay. I, I, I would, I was, she was probably my, she was the last one out for me. Like I Holland, but I just don't like, I don't think her game is co quite complete yet to, uh, to take down a win, but hmm. she's getting there. It, it'll happen any any week now, I'm sure. All right, why not this week? You know, yeah, why not this week? What do y'all got for your dark horse? Dark horse picks, man, are near impossible at this point. And whichever one I pick is going to lose to Trevor's pick by like 25. I'm always the only thing I've ever really been good at with these since we've been doing these the last couple of years is the dark horse picks. Like I, I always like, well, Hunter beat me by 10, but at least I got the dark horse. That was how it always was last year. This Trevor, year I'm hanging on, but Trevor picked the only one outside the top 30 that. No, there's, there's we, really is going to probably do solid out here. What about your boy? Which one? Rodolin. Cole Rodolin. I don't really like him at this course. 
Why? I don't know. I just didn't feel it. See, I was looking at him. He's losing this week. He's, yeah, he's losing it. I'm man. not losing it. I just don't feel him. This he's week. losing the passion, man. Uh, Things are falling apart. I was looking at last year's leaderboard. I was looking at last year's leaderboard, and really there was two names that kind of stuck out. They were in the top 20. One was Garrett Gerthy, and the other was Chris Clemens. And I can't ride with double G. So Chris Clemens. Dang, dude. Worked for me last week. Um, hey, baby, let's go. I got the goose man, Aaron Gossage. He's probably the best pick because, I mean, he. I think he was like third last year. Yeah, snuck in. The low ceiling forehands are, are just legit. And Gossage is pretty good these days. Um, so I like him a lot at this course. Yeah. Sweet. What are the uh, prediction points? Uh, yeah, right now I'm up 45 to 43. So it's still neck and neck. Yeah, nothing crazy has happened. Just wait till Holland wins. This week. It's pretty insane <laughs> that we haven't. I mean, there's the last few weeks we've been very parallel. Now we have pretty significant differences. I think like four different. This one will players. definitely shake up. So there will be a, there will yeah. well unless we all, get zero. I say unless we <laughs> all just lose, but there's a good chance there's Someone's a good Someone's getting at least two points of the dark horse. Yeah. Heck yeah. All right. All right, guys, there you have it. Thank you once again for tuning in to the preview show. Get out and watch the OTB open this weekend, presented by MVP. Catch you in the next one. Peace.